My name is Vesna Terzic, and I would like to welcome you uh, to Discovering OpenSea's Web Learning Series. The topic for this seminar is force-based element versus displacement-based element. Uh, in this seminar, I'll first uh, provide a first introduction for you, explaining why is it important to get familiar with two types of elements, uh, force-based and displacement-based elements in OpenSeas. Then I'll give you a theory of force-based pin elements, and I'll give you a theory of displacement-based pin column element, and then I'll follow with examples uh, give you a summary and conclusions and answer all of your questions. Uh, contrary to concentrated plasticity models, elastic element with rotational springs at element ends uh, is an example of these elements with concentrated plasticity. Uh, Force-based element and displacement-based element, they permit spread of plasticity along the element uh, and this figure uh, shows uh, that it's certain sections uh, you define uh, certain uh, elevations along the length of your element, you define uh, your section, and in this way you account for, for you're able to account for the spread, spread of plasticity along your element. Uh, These uh, two elements, they belong to a group of uh, distributed plasticity models. Um, These uh, distributed plasticity models, they allow yielding to occur at any location along the element, uh, which is especially important in the presence of distributed element loads. An example is a girder with a really high gravity load. There. Uh, plastic hinge can occur uh, in the middle of the beam. OpenSea's commands for defining uh, force-based element and displacement-based element have the same arguments. So after the, you specify what type of element you want to use, in this example is force beam column, uh, you need to define a tag. For your element, you need to define end modes of your element. You need to define number of integration points along the element. You need to define the uh, section uh, that you want to assign to each integration point of your element. And at the end, you define transformation tag uh, that actually calls uh, geometric transformation that is going to be applied or, or, on your element. So this way, uh, you, you could account for, for large deformation on your element. So if you look at the arguments for displacement beam column element, uh, you'll see that they're identical. However, a beam column element needs to be modeled differently using these two elements to achieve a comparable level of accuracy. Uh, and the intent of this seminar is to show users how to properly, properly model frame elements, elements with both force-based and displacement-based beam column elements. In order to enhance your understanding of these two elements and to assure the correct application, I will present the theory of these two elements and I'll demonstrate their, their application on two examples. If we look at one element, uh, which is for, for uh, this case, it, it, it's in 2D, um, you'll see that this element has six degrees of freedom in a global system. However, for uh, the architecture of OpenSea, uh, open uh, it's easier to, to work, to, de to develop uh, element state determination in the basic system, which means it's instead of looking at six degrees of freedom in the global uh, system, we are gonna have only three degrees of freedom uh, which are uh, designated with the letter V, and uh, they represent axial deformation and rotations at, at, the, at the element ends. And 
similarly, we have three, uh, three basic forces, Q1, Q2, and Q3, which are axial force and two bending moments uh, at the column ends. So when we start uh, defining uh, element state determination, <coughs> what we have to solve is the, uh, the, the problem that we have to solve is for given V, uh, find Q, which means for given basic deformations of the element, give me the basic forces of the element. After we know the basic forces of the element, we perform geometric transformation uh, to get element forces in the global system, which means that we're going to get um, six forces, vector of six forces as the output. This geometric transformation uh, can be linear, P delta, or rotational. Linear uh, transformation does not consider uh, large displacements. P delta uh, considers it in an approximate form, and rotational uh, gives an exact, exact, exact formulation of the large uh, displacements. So another reason for having um, element uh, state determination defined in a basic system is um, uh, option uh, actually uh, change to uh, consider independently geometric nonlinearity from um, element nonlinearity, which comes from material nonlinearity. So in the, this way, you are solving two independent uh, problems. So uh, I'll first start, start with describing uh, displacement-based elements of open field. So uh, the displacement-based approach follows standard finite element procedures, where we interpolate sections the form, section deformations from an approximate displacement field, and then use principles of virtual displacements to form the element equilibrium relationships. So to approximate nonlinear element response, uh, constant axial deformation and linear curvature distribution are enforced along the element length. Uh, and this is exact only for prismatic linear elastic elements. As soon as elements enters the nonlinear range, uh, it deviates for, for this uh, assumed uh, distribution of, of axial deformation and curvature along the element. So to represent uh, the uh, distribution of deformations along the element, what we actually need to do, we need to discretize our element into many pieces, uh, which is uh, referred, uh, which most commonly used term for this is mesh refinement. So we need to refine our mesh in order to capture the uh, response um, or deformation of the structure. An example would be like for an element, uh, curvature distribution along the element uh, is given like this, and this is the exact solution. So by if we uh, followed, if we had only one element and use linear curvature along the element, we wouldn't be able to capture uh, this shape of the curvature. So in order to capture uh, this shape of, of curvature distribution along the element, we need to split or discretize our element into uh, many pieces. So now I'll try to uh, provide you with a theory behind displacement beam element. I'm going to look for simplicity. Uh, of this webinar, I'm going to look at 2D element and describe the whole process behind uh, displacement-based element. So, for um, for assumed uh, for approximated distribution of axial deformation and curvature along the element, I will try to uh, establish relationship between displacement field, which is given by um, 
axial displacements along the element and transverse displacement along the element. These two, uh, these two values uh, provide us with a deformed shape of, of our element. So, um, using matrix shape functions that are Hermitian polynomials and designated with n of x, I will be able to uh, pr uh, to to, uh, to have a relationship between displacement field, uh, which contains the vectors of, uh, which contains the axial displacement along the element and transverse displacement along, along the element as function of basic forces, which are V1, V2, and V3. Um, this <laughs> shape functions are, are derived such that they provide linear distribution of axial deformation and, oh, sorry, constant distribution of axial deformation and linear distribution of curvature. So next, I'm going to develop relationship between strain and displacements. Um, strain at each section uh, at the reference axis is first uh, derivative of axial displacements and curvature at any uh, section along the element is second derivative of the transverse displacement at that same location. Uh, after we, uh, we perform uh, a math here, uh, we're going to get a uh, relation between the sectional deformations. So at one section, uh, we, we will know uh, what are our uh, strain and curvature as a function of basic uh, basic deformation. So this can be written in a compact matrix form where B, uh, capital B, represents the strain uh, displacement relationship. So it's the matrix that uh, gives us, uh, for a given B, it gives us sectional deformation at each location along the element. Um, so we said our problem is for a given V, find Qs. For a given uh, basic deformation, find basic forces. Um, so to find element forces uh, given basic deformations, uh, we use principle of virtual displacements to formulate equilibrium between sectional forces and basic forces, forces in a basic system. And uh, here we see that the basic forces are calculated uh, by integration of uh, sectional forces along the element. This, this is weak equilibrium uh, that leads to error in force boundary conditions. Uh, that internal forces are not in equilibrium with element basic forces. So uh, what does this mean? So if you if you make a model of your beam column element and you use displacement uh, based element to, to to model it, and you record sectional forces at node i and you record um, at, at node i or j, which are n nodes of an element, and then you record the forces in the element. If you compare them, uh, you won't see the same same values. Uh, due to this weak equilibrium. So sectional forces and end element forces won't be the same uh, by using these two uh, recorders. Next, uh, to assemble a tangent stiffness matrix of the system, we need to know tangent stiffness matrix of each element. And here, uh, for displacement-based element, tangent stiffness matrix is derivative of basic forces uh, over uh, basic deformations. And after simplification of this formula, uh, you're going to see that it's calculated by integration of sectional stiffness along the element, where sectional stiffness is calculated by integration of um, material tangent stiffness uh, for all fibers of the section.
So now I'm going to go through the process uh, that OpenSys goes through in calculating basic forces given basic deformations. So we start for for V uh, having the vector V. So based on uh, assumption that we had before of linear distribution of curvature along the element land and constant distribution of uh, axial deformation along the element land, we derive uh, this relationship between sectional deformations, which are axial, strain, and curvature, uh, with respect to basic forces. So now if you know basic forces, we can calculate uh, sectional deformations at each point along the element land. Now, uh, knowing sectional deformation, we can find strain in each uh, fiber of our section. So in any location in the section, we can find what is the, the strain that corresponds to that location. Knowing strain, strain relationship for our material, and uh, then for a given uh, strain, we can find stress that corresponds to the strain. And then by integrating uh, the stresses along the area, so which means like for all fibers of the section, uh, we, are, uh, we can calculate our sectional forces, which for this example are axial force and bending moment. Now, knowing sectional forces, and using formula that I showed you in the previous slide uh, for basic forces. So by integrating sectional forces now uh, along the element land, we find the basic forces. Uh, this line will go through geometric transformation uh, to have them in a global coordinate system. So as you see, uh, the procedure that is used for force-based element is straight uh, forward. Uh, in one step of analysis, you, you solve the whole problem. So the only thing with a displacement-based element is that you need to discretize your element. So, so instead of modeling it with only one element, you need several elements along the length of, of your uh, limb column element or frame element. So next, I'm going to talk about force-based element. So the force-based approach uh, relies on the availability of an exact equilibrium solution within the basic system of a beam column element. Um, equilibrium between element and section forces is now exact, uh, and this holds in the range of uh, constitutive nonlinearity. Section forces are determined from the basic forces by interpolation within the basic system. Uh, and this interpolation comes from static equilibrium and provides constant axial force and linear distribution of bending moment in the absence of distributed element loads. So to formulate compatibility between section and element deformations, now we use principle of virtual forces. And here you see the relationship between the basic forces and sectional deformations. Uh, so now basic forces are cal calculated as an um, integral of sexual deformation over the length of the element. And in this way, uh, you see that uh, you can, uh, with only one element representing your real frame element, you can achieve a better agreement uh, with, with the cur real curvature of your element using this force-based element. And so the difference between the two is the first one starts with assuming displacement uh, uh, deformation, sorry, deformation field, and this one, uh, force-based formulation, is based on um, exact, um, exact equilibrium, uh, uh, on exact equilibrium. So let me now describe it in, in more detail. So 
from static equilibrium, uh, given our basic forces, which are Q1, Q2, and Q3, from static equilibrium, uh, we can find exact internal forces along our element. So um, here, if, if, only, if there is only Q1, you can find axial force anywhere in your, uh, along uh, your element, and you see the distribution is constant. Then if you apply uh, bending moments at the ends of your element, uh, you're going to calculate your shear forces that are a function of these bending moments. And then if you uh, look at the free body diagram of your element, so you, you break your element anywhere uh, in between, and then you f look at the free body diagram and form uh, uh, equilibrium, uh, you're going to get bending moment, internal moment at that location as function of uh, Q2 and Q3, basic forces Q2 and Q3. And uh, the distribution is linear, as you see. And this uh, example is uh, for a case that there are no any distributed loads along the element. In case there are distributed loads along the element, you can again find uh, knowing uh, exact bending moments in your elements, you can find, again, exact uh, solution or exact force interpolation functions. So now that we know uh, the relationship between Q1 and uh, axial, internal axial forces, and then Q2, Q3, and bending moment, we can form, uh, we can form uh, compact in a compact form we can form relationship between uh, internal forces s of x and basic forces uh, that are there in our uh, system and the interpolation matrix uh, is designated as b so uh, the compatibility between section and element deformation is derived using uh, principle of virtual forces, and this compatibility is satisfied in integral integral form at the element ends rather rather than for all values of x. Uh, so now we have weak compatibility uh, in case of force based element. You remember, in case of displacement based element, we get weak equilibrium. So now we have uh, weak compatibility. To assemble tangent stiffness matrix of the system, we need to know tangent stiffness matrix of each element. And uh, since this element is based, uh, flexibility based element, uh, basically we're going to find stiffness uh, knowing the flexibility of each element. So now stiffness is inverse of flexibility. And flexibility is uh, calculated by derivation of basic deformation with respect to basic forces. And you see that you calculate it by integration of sectional uh, flexibility along the element length, knowing this force interpolation function. And uh, sectional flexibility is calculated as inverse of sectional stiffness that is showed uh, earlier how, how to, uh, I showed you how you can calculate it. So let me now guide you through the whole process of solving uh, a problem that we have that is for a given V, uh, calculate Q. So for a given uh, element deformation, calculate uh, basic forces. So now uh, we, uh, we have a little bit more complicated problem to solve the process is not straightforward anymore as it was for displacement-based element. Uh, so now you need to solve a nonlinear equation, which actually uh, says that external element deformations need to be in equilibrium with the in internal element deformations. Uh, and this nonlinear uh, equation is solved by Newton iterative procedure uh, that starts with an initial guess for for Q for uh, basic forces, and then they are updated until the equilibrium is achieved, until this uh, residual that I call residual deformation 
or difference between external and internal are zero. So using uh, compatibility, uh, I, I showed you uh, on the previous slides uh, that this internal element deformations can be calculated by integration of sectional deformations along the element length. So now, uh, to find this, uh, we need uh, to find deformations, sectional deformations at each integration point. So again, we have inverse problem uh, from what we had before. Again, we need to solve a nonlinear equation uh, to find uh, the sectional deformation given uh, sectional forces. So just as a reminder, I remember if, if we have given Q, for a given Q, we can find sectional uh, forces, S of X, by using this uh, interpolation matrix B, which is the uh, exact one. So knowing S, so S is the one that we know, uh, given the Q in the previous equation. So S is the one that we know. Uh, so now we have to solve uh, this uh, nonlinear equation, which states that we uh, applied sectional forces need to be in equilibrium with the resisting sectional, for sectional forces. And again, this is solved using unit interactive procedure where we start with some initial guess for E, uh, for sectional deformation, and then uh, we update it until uh, we achieve uh, the equilibrium. So, as I pointed out before, the applied sectional forces uh, we can easily calculate given the Q uh, from, from this equation. So now, for a current state of, of uh, section deformation, E, we go through the same process as we went uh, before with a uh, displacement-based element, so knowing sectional deformation, we can calculate the strain at each fiber of our section, and then knowing the strain, we can calculate the stress for each fiber of the section. We integrate them uh, along the area, over the area of the section, and then we get the sectional forces, which are uh, axial force and bedding moment for each section. Uh, in this case, is at each integration point along the section. So, so now we have applied forces. We, we calculated our uh, resisting sectional forces. We check if they're in equilibrium. If they are not, we repeat iterations uh, at, until we achieve this equilibrium. To uh, summarize uh, this slide once more, I want to point out that there are two levels of iteration. There is a first level of iteration uh, where we are trying to find Q to achieve equilibrium between a uh, given deformation vector and resisting uh, or internal deformation vector. And for each step uh, of iterations here, we need to solve this whole problem. So we are going to go through several iterations at the sectional level to find the formations uh, that correspond to that one. So now we see that uh, to solve a force-based, uh, uh, to solve a problem where we use force-based beam column element, it's numerically uh, more cumbersome, uh, more expensive, computationally more expensive, uh, but you see that you need to use, uh, generally, the advantage of this element is that you need to use only one element uh, to model your frame element, having several integration points along the element, while with a displacement-based element, you, you need to discretize it. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, Force-based beam column element uh, starts from uh, using the uh, exact interpolation function of forces, 
violent displacement based element uh, we we started from uh, assumed uh, interpolation function of of displacement along the the element so uh, due to this initial uh, or starting point for derivation of each element uh which is exact in case of force based element and approximate in case of displacement beam column element, uh, we can achieve, I think, greater accuracy uh, when using force based element than displacement based element, especially if you look at the local local deformation that are uh, curvature and strains. So now I will proceed with examples where, where I'm going to demonstrate um, uh, the application of these two elements and how to model the same, the one same element using either of the two elements uh, and to, uh, how you should model them to achieve comparable accuracy. Um, I'll start with the steel beam um, that is uh, taken from example from uh, known Hofer and Filippo. And what they did in this paper, uh, they looked at the steel beam, uh, which was uh, in 3D and had like a um, box cross section where each fiber was defined with a stress strain relationship, which was elastic perfectly plastic with some strain hardening. It was fully fixed at end A, and it was uh, it has uh, rollers at node B. Uh, the load that is applied on the element is axial force of it, which puts the element in compression of 20 mega newtons, and they had distributed loads along the element in y. Uh, and, and y and z axis of two mega newtons per, per meter. So, what it is um, in this study, they looked at the exact solution for this element, and then they used force based and beam column elements, and they were changing the number of these elements along of this member, and they were changing number of integration points uh, for each element. So let me let me show you the results of their analysis. So um, what they looked at, uh, they looked at the error in estimating the curvature at a point A, and they looked at the error in estimating rotation and element at at, uh, at end B. So first, I'm going to show you the error in uh, estimating rotations. So and keep in mind that rotation uh, belongs to group of global response quantities. So here you'll see uh, on x-axis is like uh, the number of elements that are used to model this uh, steel beam. And then um, they had for each value of of, uh, of number of element ends, uh, they're showing three bars which correspond to a number of integration points that they use along each element. So they consider three options, three, five, and, and seven points along the element. And then uh, they did the same study on curvature uh, error, uh, which is local response. And uh, this is uh, in the first Zero here, I'm showing uh, the results of force-based element, and uh, in the second row, I'm showing you the results in the displacement-based element. And now I'll slowly go uh, through uh, both elements and uh, give you the, the outcomes of, of this study. So let us first look at the uh, force-based element. So here we see that the accuracy of the solution can be improved by either increasing the number of integration points or the number of elements. Uh, so you see, as you increase the number of elements, error goes to zero, or for this one case of one element, if you increase the number of integration points, uh, error goes to zero. 
And this is basically due to the fact that force-based element uses the exact force interpolation functions, and that does not involve discretization error, but only the numerical error. Um, and we can see that an error less than 2% is obtained for both global and local response quantities with only one element and seven integration points. So you see that this error here for one element and seven integration points is really small for both global and local response. So let us now look at the displacement-based element. So here you see that accuracy of the solution can only be improved by increasing the number of elements. So as you increase the number of elements, uh, the error drops close to zero, uh, zero in case of global response quantities and uh, is very small for local response quantity, also very close to zero. Uh, but you see that there is no sensitivity with respect to number of integration points. So it doesn't really matter how many integration points you you have the accuracy uh, of the solution is not improved. And this is due to the fact that displacement-based elements uses displacement interpolation functions that approximate the exact solution and does involve uh, both discretization and numerical error. So here, another thing to notice is that you need eight element, to use eight elements um, to reduce error to approximately zero. For, this is for global response quantity, but for local response quantity, you need 16, which is um, way more than what you needed for, for global response. So, in summary, um, I want to say that accuracy of the solution can be improved for force-based elements by either increasing the number of integration points or the number of elements. Uh, however, it is um, much more, uh, it's less computation, there, there are going to be less computational cost if you use only one element and increase number of integration points. And then um, accuracy can be improved uh, when using displacement-based element only by increasing the number of elements. So we saw that increasing number of integration points along the element won't improve the solution. Um, next, um, what we saw in this study is that in case of force-based element, both local and global quantities converge fast with increasing number of integration points. Uh, but in case of displacement-based elements, we saw that uh, in case of uh, reducing the error for curvature, we needed to use 16 elements, while for rotation we needed to use uh, only eight elements. And this is because the uh, higher derivatives converge slower to exact solution and thus um, accurate determination of local response quantities. They require a finer, finite element mesh than the accurate determination of global response quantities. So next I'm going to show you an uh, uh, example of a uh, bridge column um, this is a practical example, and and here I just wanted to demonstrate uh, how we, how accurately we can predict of uh, the response of a real uh, specimen uh, using uh, both uh, force-based and displacement-based element in open seas. So for this demonstration, I used um, uh, experimental results from Lehman and Mayle test that they did in uh, 1998. Um, and this column uh, had a height of 96 inches or 8 feet. Uh, diameter was 2 feet. Um, the ratio for the longitudinal reinforcement was 1.5%. The ratio of transfer reinforcement was 0.7%. And strength of concrete at the day of the test was 4.4 KSI. Sorry. Um, the laws that they applied on the specimen uh, was uh, unidirectional uh, cyclic up to ductility of 7. 
and um, I calibrated uh, this element using force-based element and five integration points uh, along the length of the element to provide better accuracy of local strains. Uh, number of integration points is chosen such that integration weight of the end node matches the plastic hinge length. So after I calibrated uh, my model, uh, this is uh, what I got. In red, you see the experimental results for force displacement relationship. And in dark blue, you see um, the results I got in open seas using force-based element. Um, you see that this um, element failed at this last ductility of seven. So uh, for the purpose of comparison, uh, displacement-based and force-based element for this study, I'm just going to look at the, at the hysteresis up to ductility of five. This is like concluding with this cycle of flooding. So I'm just going to look at the portion of the result. So, uh, so now if I just uh, replace force-based element with displacement-based element, which means I'm modeling my column with only one displacement beam column element, you'll see that the response is going to be very different. So this is using force-based element, and here you see the response using displacement-based element. So we are highly, um, we are highly under-conservative here. So, so we are overshooting the, the strength of the column greatly, almost two times. Uh, so you see that you cannot achieve, uh, you know, accurate solution uh, this way, uh, modeling your column with only one displacement based beam column element. So and then I'm going to show you how with the increase of numbers of, of displacement beam column elements along the, the length of the column, you can achieve uh, better uh, accuracy. So I will start with one element, uh, then I will increase the number of elements to two. So you see we're getting, uh, with the light blue line, we're getting much closer to the red, which is experimental results. Uh, and then uh, if you use four elements, displacement-based uh, elements to model this column, uh, you're going to get pretty, pretty close to the experimental results. So to match the measured column response, the, the column had to be modeled with either one force-based beam column element or with four displacement-based beam column element. And the accuracy by using uh, either of the two, uh, I think, was uh, pretty good. We, uh, I could match the experimental results uh, in a good way for this global response quantity that I was looking at, so which is force-displacement relationship. Um, local response quantity could not be compared due to the lack of experimental data. However, uh, it is advisable to use more than four displacement beam column elements when predicting local response quantities. Uh, in the uh, example that I showed before, example one, you saw that you need uh, two times more uh, elements along the land to, to match the local response quantities compared as compared to the global response quantities. And here I'm just showing you the final results with the uh, with using force based one force based element uh, versus four displacement based element. And you see that both of them uh, are in good agreement with with experimental results. Um, and now, at the end, I'm, I'm going to give you the summary of, um, of, of, of this uh, seminar. So the first point is that force-based element and displacement-based element cannot be modeled in the same way as they inherently different from each other. And I showed it uh, to you in this presentation. Uh, accuracy of the solution can be improved for force-based element by either increasing the number of integration points or the number of elements. It is computationally less expensive to increase the uh, number of integration points and to model or frame elements with only uh, one uh, force-based beam column element. Um, 
for displacement based uh, elements, the accuracy can be improved only by increasing the number of elements. It's not sensitive to uh, increase of number of integration points. In case of force based elements, both local and global quantities converge fast with increasing number of integration points. But in case of displacement based elements, higher der derivatives converge slower to the exact solution, and thus accurate de determination of local response quantities requires a finer, finite element mesh than the accurate determination of global response quantities. Although computationally more expensive, force-based element generally improves global and local response without mesh refinement. Um, and the last point is uh, that uh, to accurately capture local response of elements whose plastic hinge, hinges locations and lengths can be estimated somehow, uh, number of integration points of fiber uh, of, of a force-based element has to be chosen such that the integration rates at locations of plastic hinges match the plastic hinge length. Uh, I will thank you for your uh, presence here with me, and now I will try to answer uh, all of your questions.